Welcome back to RSA Conference 2021, live from Virtual Broadcast Alley. It's our last interview, but not the least. I'm your host, Matt Alderman. Joining me for this segment is Kevin Gallagher. He is the Chief Revenue Officer at NetSparker by Invicti. Kevin, welcome to the show. Thanks, Matt. Glad to be here. Now, we're going to talk about how to build and maintain a resilient web app security program. But I think first, it helps to kind of set uh, a little background. NetSparker, Acunetics, all part of now what's called Invicti Security. Invicti Security. Yep, exactly. I remember a year ago us talking about some of the branding discussions about how how do you do the brands. I thought you did a really excellent job, by the way, of using Invicti as an umbrella and keeping the NetSparker and Acunetic brands in place and i thought i thought you you and the team did a really good job with that thanks man i appreciate that yeah and we you know obviously a lot of a lot of folks understand and know uh net a lot of people have been following and utilizing you know acunetics and, and we didn't want to lose you know the, the those brands and but what we wanted to do was was bring the best of both worlds together uh and create a, a you know invicti security that's going to be able to provide a you know the best web application security uh platform that that that, that we can, um, you know, combining you know all the scalability and proof-based scanning together with with you know fast, quick, uh, you know, security scanning, and and has been great for us. It's really been our mission to really transform the transform the way you know web apps are secured, and I think we're we're doing that with Invicti. Yeah, so it, l- let's get into that a little bit, right? So, I, I <laughs> we we did a segment on your indicator report, right? The Invicti mm-hmm. indicator. I can't remember the ex- exact name, but you guys measure and have measured for the last few years kind of critical vulnerabilities in the space. And I, sure. in, in the way I refer to it is 2020 was the lost year, right? Sure. We didn't make progress. We saw a lot of stuff kind of flatline in, in making improvements in our web app security. We saw critical vulnerabilities tick up a little bit last year because I think we lost focus a little bit around the pandemic and the move to remote work and all this other stuff. And the, and the security teams had a lot of other things on their plates of getting VPNs up and running and figuring out how to get remote workers connected. So we lost a year on progress on the application security space. And, and so when we think about re- either restarting our program or actually focusing on our web app program, you know, what are the things we need to think about on how do we approach web app security? Absolutely, and you know, we, we we really have put together a really comprehensive you know life cycle around you know how to manage vulnerabilities, um, and and it, and it's really kind of an, almost like a five step approach, and we can we can walk through this approach, and and, and please you know, interrupt me as we're going through it, and, and you know and ask questions to get deeper into it. But you know what we've seen is in, in all this experience that we've had coming to the to RSAs and, and having conversations with our customers is that we have customers that just do not know, especially in today's environment, how many web apps they actually have. Um, so the first step that we that we've put together in this is really let's go out and discover and figure out how many web applications you have, you know, in your environment. So let's go out there and and and, and you know take a look, see what's the, you know, those publicly facing web applications. We're going to go out and scan. Uh, for those, and then really allow you to say, okay, here's here's the the set of web apps I have, and now let me take a look at these and, and try and figure out what are my most critical, all the way down to least critical, so that we can start to at least you know, build that baseline of how we're going to to you know attack uh, this 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 problem around vulnerabilities in web apps. Yeah, so I want to CIS control number two, inventory <laughs> your software, right? And, yeah. and I mean, web yeah. apps are, are software at the end of the day. And, and yes, there are also physical components that make up those web applications, which is CIS, but <laughs> number one, yeah. right? Sure. This has been a challenge for organizations for a long time. When, when I was at Tenable, when Paul and I were doing the research in the web app security space, we were starting to think about this problem like, wait, who's doing the discovery? Like, <laughs> if, if a customer gives me their web apps, is that all of them? I mean, how do you think about kind of automated, continuous discovery of your web properties? Because as we saw in the pandemic, Kevin, we saw a pr- proliferation of new sites, new w- web apps coming up to support the remote worker, to support move to the cloud, to support uh, the consumer engagement. An organization that's trying to do this manually has to be yes. behind the curve. 
Absolutely. It, it's, it's, it, it is a massive challenge to understand and know. I mean, you, you, when you when you look at um, you know a, a quick example, uh, marketing department puts up a you know a, a website for a fundraising event that they're going to do. So let's say we're going to sign up for a marathon and do a fundraiser. How do you know if that ever came down again? Is it still out there and you know and and never been you know looked at, maintained, or taken down? And how many of those do you have you know in your organization that you have no idea um, that are still sitting out there? So that's the really the importance of the discovery is, to, is first to just really understand and know how many apps do I actually really have? Yeah, and the second part of that then is the ability to classify criticality, another Correct. major gap in just like basic cyber hygiene, right? I, we we talked about this for years when I was at Qualys, Tenable, elsewhere. You know, asset identification is tough, but then asset classification is even harder. What have you guys done to really help make it easier to really identify or help classify the criticality of these, of these different applications? Sure, sure. I think you know, one of, one of the, the biggest things first is, like I said, is, is understanding and knowing. The second is looking at what is on, you know, like what are those web apps uh, supporting and servicing? And it's not just the web apps, it's the web services, APIs. You know, does it contain, you know, PII? Uh, is it a HIPAA related? Uh, is it a financial, you know, related app? And making sure that those are the ones that we want to, to address first. Um, and, and as we go through and start to, you know, really identify those types of applications, we really want to now say, okay, we need to take care of this first. But at the same time, we don't want to ignore everything else. Right? And, and, and that's been the way web application security has been for a very long time. It's okay, we're just going to address our most critical apps. And that's it. Because that's all we have the time for. We're making it so that you can address your critical apps and everything else all in a very timely manner. All right, so let's talk about step two, which has to be some level of scanning detection for vulnerabilities. And maybe where we get into the criticality a little bit is the frequency at which we yep. test, right? But but walk us through kind of how you guys have laid out step number two in the process. Absolutely. So step two, I mean, the obvious thing is you're going to scan, you know, your web your web apps. Um, you know, you, whether you're using a current tool or you're, you're using a, you know, a, a, a uh, a pen testing you know company but you know you, you want to be able to go out and, and now you know scan using a high quality tool do some configuration some authentication get you know the, the the better the tool the less configuration you know you're going to need um so now you're doing that and you're going out and, and within you know 24 hours 48 hours you're going to start you know getting getting results right so so great we've gone out we've scanned but the problem is now you know let's say you have a thousand websites um, you might be looking at 8,000, 10,000 issues of various levels, you know, from critical, high critical, middle, you know, medium to low, you know, what are we supposed to do with all these? How are we, you know, what do we, the biggest challenge right now is like, we just don't know what to do. We have 10,000 issues. We have five people to deal with them. You know, where do we even start? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's where prioritization, right. Comes into play is how do you understand context based on the vulnerability <laughs> based on the exploitability, right? Kind of the, the threat vulnerability management models from a web app perspective to say, we believe these types of vulnerabilities have the highest risk and maybe these are the ones we should focus on first. So prioritization is a big part of, of interpreting the results. It is, it is. And you know, it, that's kind of, kind of step number three in this is really you know, facilitating the remediation of these vulnerabilities. Now, even before you get to the, the prioritization, what ends up happening in, in, in most organizations, and you know, depending on the, the scanner that they're using, is you know, you got these 10,000 vulnerabilities. How do you know if they're real or not? Mm. Because of the number of false positives is, is astronomical in a lot of tools. So you need to be utilizing technology that can automatically prove and, uh, you know, and triage these vulnerabilities so that you have your, 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 you know, a, a true list of how many vulnerabilities you actually now need to go mm. and remediate. Do you do that as part of the, the actual scan, or is that a follow-up to the initial scan? Are you doing the validation against false positives and knowing exactly which ones are vulnerable because you've proved it as part of the scan, or is that a secondary step? As part of the scan. Okay. So as part of the scan, we are utilizing our you know, proprietary proof-based scanning technology so that developers can automatically confirm issues and they get proof that that issue is, is true. It's, an, it's like an extracted database detail 
um, against that that vulnerability. So that helps maybe take what normally would be 10,000 vulnerabilities in another tool maybe down to a couple thousand that are actually real, right? I, do you know correct. what that kind of normal kind of drop in the, the uh, when you weed out false positives, do you, is it 50% improvement, 80%? Yeah, probably, yeah, somewhere in that in that range, you know, 50 to 80% improvement uh, in terms of, of true vulnerabilities that you need to that you need to, to, to say, hey, we need to really, we really need to take care of these now. Okay. So I got those. I've done some prioritization. Now somebody has to go fix it, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So that's where, you know, we, we recommend it, you know, integrating into, into, uh, into development. And what we're doing at, 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 you know, at this level is, okay, you know, we had 10,000, you know, let's say we, we've, we've narrowed that down to, to five thousand and we have severity of medium you know high that needs to be fixed and we know that these are direct impact vulnerabilities so what we want to be able to do is automatically create a ticket in the developer's existing issue tracker so that is part of their daily workflow so this isn't this is no longer saying okay we're going to take all these vulnerabilities we're going to put them into a spreadsheet and then we're going to turn it into a pdf and then we're going to email it around and then you know we're going to hope that the developers you know take a look at it and, and fix it the problem with that has been you know the developers will get this report and they're going to be like you know this is you're crying wolf again we can't have all these these there's so many false positives but when we can actually say yes this is a vulnerability it's been proven it is one that it has direct impact. We want to then be able to go in and create a, a ticket right into the developer's workflow. Then they can fin- you know, get pick that up, fix that vulnerability as, a, as part of their daily routine, not as something that's a subset of what they're trying to do, but as a part of their daily routine. Yeah, I mean, I've known for years that the, the, the developers are never going to log into a security tool. They have their tool sets in front of them. And so we've seen this shift, and you guys have been on the cusp of this as well, is how do I take those results and integrate them into the tool sets? This is the real kind of vision around DevSecOps to me, is that these tools are integrated and the data is in the right place because there's two use cases that have to be solved here. There's a development use case around fixing these and and making sure their code is more secure there's a security use case and so yeah maybe the security team will log in to a security tool to manage monitor progress etc but for the developers to fix it you got to put it where they are otherwise they're just there's no visibility there for them oh absolutely absolutely so so you know it's it's the it's the two parts of it right you're you're 100 correct matt that the visibility is huge but also making sure that we're giving them accurate information that they can do something with so that so and, and and through the automation, what it does is it just cuts out all of the back and forth. It cuts out all of the you know um, I, I don't believe yous. It cuts out I didn't get the emails right. It, it is all automated, and and working in the sense that you're getting actual uh, real data that's proven that you need to fix, and it's being fixed in your in the way that you'd like to to work. Yeah, and the best example I saw this when I was at uh, Layered Insight. We had a meeting, we were meeting with a customer, they were a prospect, they ended up being a customer. And I remember them telling us, yes, daily we sit down with the security and DevOps teams and we have this list and every day we're debating which ones we're gonna fix, which ones we're not gonna fix. That's just a waste of time, right? I mean, to automate this is a much, much more efficient process. Oh, absolutely, and and, and, you know, take take this back to the beginning. So we we said, all right, you got 10,000 vulnerabilities. That's impossible in that in the in the way that you just described. You'll never get through those ten thousand. Yeah, definitely not. Um, step number four: scheduling continuous integration, which means this is a closed loop process. And I think this is yeah. the other important part here: continuous monitoring, continuous testing is now critical, primarily because I always go back to my vol management days. If I could get a company to scan their entire network once a month or once a quarter, we were happy. In the application world, stuff is changing daily or multiple times a day, which means you, you've got to be more real time. Otherwise, you can't keep up with these code pushes. Yeah, absolutely. And, and what you know, one of the really cool things um, that we're doing is actually integrating into the DevOps pipeline as well. So. We told you on the outside part, where we scanned everything that, that we found externally, 
and we're, we're giving you, you know, true accuracy on uh, the number of, of vulnerabilities that you have, and we're passing that to the developer. We can also take it from the other side and say, okay, as part of the develop, uh, DevOps pipeline, as you're building a web application, if you introduce a vulnerability, we are scanning and we are telling you that you just introduced this vulnerability. The, the, the developer can then immediately, again, with proof, see that this vulnerability was introduced, fix it. So then we're, 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 we're monitoring prior to web apps going into production. Yeah. So now we, now we, now we got both ends covered. Yeah, and this has been, I think, a challenge for a lot of organizations. We think about pre-production so much with static analysis, software composition analysis. Uh, now you've got IAST in, which you guys have built an yes. IAST capability, yes. and I think that's where you're doing it from, right? That's on Correct. one side. And maybe you're doing some container scanning and a few other things pre-production. Then it goes into production. You still have to deal with the runtime side. So you guys have done a pretty good job of balancing the runtime with your DAST offering and also leveraging the IAS, I think, on the pre-production side to give that visibility before the code ever gets to production. Therefore, it's one less vulnerability the DAST scanner has to pick up, right? 100%. Right. So, it, And that's what, what I talked about in the beginning is this, this life cycle. So it starts with, you know, hey, we got to secure what's already out in the wild. Like that, that's the most important thing to us. We got to identify and discover how many assets we actually have. We then have to figure out what is our most critical apps and make sure that those are secure without ignoring everything else. Uh, we want to be able to make sure that our, that our developers are fixing those vulnerabilities by making it as easy as possible for them to get the data and, and understand it and then be able to go in and, and fix that environment. Then we want to be able to get on the the you know, more proactive side right so that's kind of all on the reactive side so now we want to get on the more proactive side and on the proactive side we're integrating into DevSecOps. we're in that environment and in that world and we're making it easier for for uh, developers to understand and know that vulnerabilities have been introduced prior to apps going into production yeah big 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 hurdle great capabilities so what's the last step step number five yeah, that's really the that whole thing working in sync constantly in your environment. It's it's not it doesn't end with just one pass through, right? But this is a continuous environment. So we're continually scanning what's out in the wild. We're continually scanning what's going on in your environment, and we are we are setting up. You know, as we go along, we're we're creating better uh, policies and better groups, and we're we're making sure that you know, as new developers come uh, on board, that they get it you know, assigned in, and so that you know, we know where to send vulnerabilities to. So it's just continuing that 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 process so that you can scale to ten thousand, a hundred thousand, a million, you know, web apps, um, especially in this environment when you have microservices and you have mm -hmm. you know containers and yep. uh, so many APIs and so many microservices, right? Um, the, it, it, it it become almost impossible to manage without this type of automation. It's really unique and and, and, and new in this in this space, right? When you when you think about it, it's it's gone from, all right, I'm going to scan as many web apps as I can, and most of the time it's just going to be my most critical ones because that's what I, I'm concerned about. To, you know, and, and just getting a report and saying, okay, here it is. Let's go try and and, and triage, or we might have to bring you know somebody in a third party. Uh, to help them go through this, all this stuff manually uh, to try and get through it. Yeah. To now having confidence in your web apps. You know, this, we went from scanning to managing. I think that's, that's the best way I, I can put it. We went from scanning web apps to managing web apps. Yeah, but we can't forget about reporting, right? Because we still oh, yeah. have to show improvement. We still have to show yep. metrics. We yep. still have to create that compliance report. We still have yes. to get metrics to the executive team and the board. So we can't forget about the reporting piece. No. But reporting can't be the mechanism that drives the program. It needs to be an outcome or an output from the program right 100 percent correct yes and, and that's exactly the approach that we're taking and, and that's you know with our with our reporting um you know and, and and being able to make sure that the reports get into the right hands at the right time having the, as we spoke about the last time the trend matrix you know report to to see you know our vulnerabilities how quickly are they being uh remediated are they being reintroduced after they've been you know remediated you know all the criticality of of the vulnerabilities you know, making sure that that, that you know our vulnerability uh, our databases is is constantly being um, updated, so that we're we're capturing you know, as many vulnerabilities as we possibly can. You know, so so yeah, that that all still has to be be occurring while you're doing this. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it it's a great approach. I think it's a very simple approach. 
um, and can be a very effective approach. Um, any anything else, Kevin? While I have you here, I don't think so, Matt. I think that that covers what I brought to the table. Awesome, Kevin. Thank you so much for joining us on Security Weekly. I appreciate it. Have a great one. You too. If anybody wants to learn more about Invicti NetSparker, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash NetSparker. With that, this is the last micro interview for Virtual Broadcast Alley, but stay tuned. Paul Security Weekly is coming up this evening.